All right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Annika, and I'm a librarian at the Herrick District Library in Holland, Michigan. Uh, today, I am beyond excited to welcome you all to a conversation with Adrian Tchaikovsky, uh, the author of many and wonderful science fiction and fantasy books. Uh, he's here to talk a little bit about his books and the process of writing great sci-fi and fantasy. And we do want our participants to be a part of it. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat and we're going to do our best to get to them. Uh, so Adrian Tchaikovsky, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I am actually going to start us right off the bat talking about one of your books in particular. We had our sci-fi fantasy book club at the library this past week and we were talking about Elder Race. Uh, Elder Race is a novella from 2021. It kind of straddles that line between, between sci-fi and fantasy. One of the things that's so unique about it is the way that it plays with perspective, uh, both thematically and literally. Uh, thematically in that kind of genre blending, and then literally in that half the book is written in first person, half of it is written in third person. I was wondering if you could start us off by talking a bit about the decision to write that book in that way. Yes, so um, there is a tradition of science fiction that goes back to really quite, quite early days, certainly back into, say, the 1930s, which basically doesn't really make a distinction between sci-fi and fantasy. In the 30s, nobody was. Uh, yeah, they, they, nobody had those that terminology anyway. But um, since then, a number of writers have kept up. It's frequently written as a kind of a a post-technological uh, dying earth style setting. So Jack Vance and Gene Wolfe are particular sort of masters of this particular, of this field. And it mixes a generally a traditional fantasy narrative with a world which is plainly a science fictional world. And a lot of ostensibly magical stuff happens, but the magical stuff is kind of understood to be technology going on in the background. And it's um it's a it's a genre that's kind of come and go and i personally love it as a reader it's not massively in in um in favor at the moment but i always wanted to give it a go and especially i was inspired by um what a short story i mentioned in the acknowledgement by gene wolf called trip trap which i think was his first published piece in fact um which again is a story told from the point of view of a very a sort of technologically sophisticated spacefaring character and a kind of a barbarian warlord who are encountering a monster and they they both interpret it by their own worlds and I thought that's a really interesting idea and since that story I've not seen anyone really playing with it so I will give it a go and one of the things I really didn't want to do um one of the ways these stories tend to go is the fantasy stuff gets kind of um sidelined it's right so you it tends to come down to well this character is just not very sophisticated they you know, they are very primitive they just don't understand what's going on and therefore their point of view is obviously inferior to the more technological understanding that the reader has and what i wanted particularly to do in this one is write a book where even though one character has a much broader point of view because they are from a more uh they're coming from a more technically educated standpoint when you actually get to what's going on they are no better equipped to deal with it than the character who is the effectively the, you know the fantasy adventuring princess mm -hmm. uh, who is seeing everything in terms of kind of magic and demons it's it's interesting that that's the that was your inspiration um and that you set out to to find to make a world where the post-technological society isn't necessarily as uh isn't inferior because one of the things that a lot of our uh, participants in the fantasy book club were most intrigued by was the idea of the disassociative cognition system um, which is a, a neural implant essentially that restricts one of the main characters from feeling emotions at the time that they're occurring um, ostensibly to allow him to make better decisions and of course, that does not always work out for him. Um, could you talk a bit about the inspiration behind that concept? Yeah. So, what, I mean, one of the other things going on in the background of Elder Race is that uh, Naya, one of the two main characters, has chronic depression. Um, his chronic depression manifests in a very, very similar way to my chronic, to my own um, sort of adventures with depression, which is to say, it 
basically comes and goes and it doesn't necessarily come and go in particularly in response to things that are happening to him it's on its own kind of cycle which can then be exacerbated by um sort of blows he receives and his sort of uh relationship with the cognition system is essentially his high-tech version of depression medication it's the idea that medication can help and at the same time it's not the be all and end all of of dealing with depression so it's it's really um it's me exploring um mental health because it's which is a topic that science fiction doesn't often touch on genre fiction doesn't often touch on i mean like a number of um aspects that were previously quite neglected it's it's certainly being picked up a lot more now um but I think there's frequently been this, this assumption that, well, obviously in the future, we will be able to cure everything. And that is a very problematic view to take both because it essentially completely erases people with mental and phys frequently physical, um, health issues. Um, and because it's probably not true, um, because uh, in the same way as, um, you know, you can get rid of rot in a tree by tearing the tree up but that's not done the tree any good um so frequently the idea of being uh, in you know that we will have to live with the with these problems in the future even if we have higher tech sort of tools to help us do so um is something that that goes sort of re remarkably unlooked at in 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 the literature mm -hmm. yeah I, I would agree with you there as a, as a fan of sci-fi and fantasy myself especially when there is i think a lot of very interesting places where you could go thinking about mental health in terms of well ptsd for example a lot of our sci-fi is military sci-fi um and then or about what does it mean to be physically different in a future mm -hmm. where those differences can be erased um i know that's also a thing that you've you've um explored in some of your books particularly the final architecture series with, yes. with shards of earth um, speaking of, I'm going to bring us away from Elder Race for just a moment because I've got a question from the audience here um, from Matt, who's just finished Shards of Earth, and he's looking forward to the rest of the series. Uh, he notes that the aliens are so imaginative. Uh, where do you draw inspiration from for your other otherworldly or inhuman species? Um, I mean, like a lot of sci-fi writers, I suspect my starting points are rooted in sort of Earth biology. Sorry, that's... You just turn that off it's all good um beg pardon sorry about that um i yeah it's no so it's no um secret i'm very fond of bugs and spiders and so forth and i tend to start with that kind of thing as my starting point which is why you've got quite a crab like alien in kittering for example but also oh good lord sorry about this Sorry, right. it's like one of those Zoom calls where a child runs in the background, but instead of a child, it's AI. Yeah. I have literally just thrown the phone across the room so that I can. <laughs> um, that technically sophisticated. Right. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, aliens in the final architecture series. Um, so, you have a crab like alien. You, actually, you have a kind of a clam. I mean, the, um, the SEL are referred to as clammed, and they're not particularly clam like, but they're probably closer to a, a sort of a sedentary mollusk. Than anything else we know on earth and then i just sort of move it on um i mean i evolution is a particular area that i've done a lot of looking at um as you know as as as, as seen in doors of Eden, as seen in children of time so speculative evolution about alien oh good lord sorry about this can you just give me one moment yep absolutely um, I am just going to reiterate for people who are watching with us that if you have any questions, um, if you would put them into oh, yeah. the Q&A section of the Zoom chat and we will be able to get into them Sorry about as that. soon as we can. That's quite right. all right. I do beg, I do beg, I do beg everyone's pardon. Uh, yes, yeah, so evolution, um, speculative evolution on alien is absolutely fascinating because obviously as evolution goes, we only have one data point, but we have an idea of how evolution works we have an idea of the logic of it essentially um even if you're not using dna a lot of that logic will carry on and a lot of um physical needs are potentially going to be the same and i mean the reason i hope a lot of my um my aliens come out feeling both quite alien and also quite plausible is just i really enjoy designing them basically that's the that's a big part of my prep 
when I um when I'm doing science fiction is I really think through how these aliens might have arisen and the evolutionary pressures on them, and then as they go into a, a sort of a, a get up to sort of a sapient level, the social pressures on them and how they inter interact with their biology. So, um, essentially, essentially the um the inspiration tends to start off with well what if you had an alien that had this particular sort of biological constraint or biological feature and then just running that thought experiment as far as it will go sorry that was a bit um a bit, bit rambling but i hope that that came through no that that's quite all right um would would you say then that you often start with like a and as you mentioned your zoological and entomological until logical, yes, interests um, shine through in all of your books. Do you normally then start with a particular animal or insect and then move on from there? Or is it more of like a Frankenstein combined it's, sort it's of process? More, it's, it's more that I'll start off with a particular aspect of one. So, for example, with um, with the Hanalambra kittering species, um, I wanted to think about what if you, so what if you have a life cycle where after you breed, you die? But you were also you have also evolved to the point where you're a, you're a sapient species, so you have a completely different as, uh, attitude towards parental care, and a different attitude attitude towards um, sort of social priorities. And you get to see a bit. I mean, um, Eyes of the Void has um, a section on a Hanalambra, Hanalambra planet where you get to see a certain amount of this this oddness going on. Um, and this kind of there's a lot of other kind of logical connections behind the scenes, which I don't I don't give explicitly, which explain why why they're so fond of games and why they are so um, fond of commerce and things like that. And the ways that they interact with humans fit quite neatly and humans kind of feel they have a handle on the Hanalandra and and that they are kind of human like. But in fact, the it's almost a convergent social evolution from very a very different starting point that's brought them into this position where they can interact quite um, happily and yeah, genuinely very, very positively with, um, with other species. Well, speaking, uh, speaking of insects, we do have a couple of insect related questions from the audience. Uh, first is from Lindsay, who's asking, do you have a favorite insect? And if you do, why is it the best? Um, insects, I think, uh, my favorite insect insect is, uh, praying mantis, praying mantis of all, all, all sorts. Um, for the same reason, my favorite, uh, spiders are jumping spiders. And in both cases, they are un very unusual in, um, invertebrates in general, certainly in arthropods as a whole, because they will look at you and they will pay attention and they will follow motion and they have an awareness of the world, which is much more focused and acute than say, you know, a regular web spinning spider or, um, or a cockroach or something like that, which tend to have quite a passive, um, uh, a passive response to things. Um, they, be, even, because of kind of convergent evolution, they've got to a point where they have this very active interest in the world, very much in the same way that we do, and that sort of you know, primates in general do, and cats do, and other other animals that we generally consider to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. And so you have this level of interaction you don't always get with um, sort of um, animals in that general sort of area of the um, of the of the um, thing. So. And I'm probably going to circle back to that in a minute, but before I do, I want to ask this question from Hope, um, who is wondering, where did you get your incredible beetle vest from your author photo? Uh, my wife actually had that specially made for me for my uh, birthday a few years back. So um, Hope should contact your wife if they would like. Uh, a... <laughs> yes, I mean, I think generally for anything like that, Etsy is your friend. And you, you know, if you, you've got the material, there's someone on Etsy who will be able to make you just about anything you want. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, so it's, it sounds like from from all this, you you do an incredible amount of research uh, even before you begin the writing process. Um, Tiffany is wondering, do you have a specific process for that research when you're writing your sci-fi, or is it is it more eclectic? So a lot of the time, it's the research which will trigger the book. Um, so, for example, Children of Time came about because I had read a fascinating piece of research by. Um, Dr. Fiona Cross um, from New Zealand about jumping spider cognition. And I wanted to run a thought experiment of, well, what if jumping spiders had the chance to become the dominant 
species and were kind of human level sapient and had um, a society, what would all that look like? And the whole book is really me just getting to do that thought experiment with a whole, with sort of a human B plot so that people don't get completely lost in the spiderness of it all. And Dogs of War, um, at least partially derived from, again, from fascinating cognitive experiments with how dogs think. And the idea that a dog, because dogs have adapted very rapidly to an environment, which is basically human society, a dog's brain works much more like a human brain than, um, say, a chimpanzee's brain, even though dogs are evolutionary far further from us, because that's what basically allows a dog to survive, is getting on with people. Um, when I'm writing hard science fiction, I'll also then need to identify areas of the book which I simply don't know about, which can be a remarkably tricky thing to do because you don't necessarily know what you don't know. It's the whole known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Um, but my general process is once I've once I've identified an area I need to know about, I will I will put out a call to people I know and say, "Does anyone know anyone who knows anything about this?" And there's always someone and the delightful thing about scientists is they are generally enormously enthusiastic and very keen to talk about their area of expertise. Um, and so all, once you find someone who is in that general area, they will very happily give you the benefit of their sort of erudition. And that's generally what I rely on. And when I'm doing something more like, um, so the, the architect series, which is a space opera, it's less bound by actual science. I'm a lot freer. I don't need to do a great deal of research as long as I make sure everything I'm imagining is consistent. And the same, it kind of then scales into writing fantasy. And again, the consistency within the fantasy world is important, but you don't need to necessarily, you know, if you want to break various rules of physics or whatever, that's fine as long as you kind of, you do, as long as they break the same way every time. As long as you're not breaking the rules you set for yourself, that it makes sense. Um, in, in a similar in a similar vein, um, we have a comment here from Steve who's saying that uh, as a new fan of your work, they really enjoy the cosmopolitan elements you incorporate from biology, technology, sociology, political science. And um, they're actually wondering about your educational background. Is there a certain area of it that informs your work particularly? Uh, I mean, honestly, most of this was stuff that I had from a child, I've, always, I've been I've always been fascinated by the natural world, and I've always done a, a fair, certain amount of reading, and more recently things like podcasts and so forth, um, to just you know to to give me more ideas to draw on. I did a um, my degree was zoology psychology, um, but honestly, that's more a result of my that's more the result of my interest than the cause of it, and. A lot of the areas I was interested in, we didn't get to spend much time on. Um, you know, for example, we did precisely one lecture on insects, which was, this is how we kill insects. So you can appreciate that wasn't really what I felt I was there to try and learn. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 I think it's more of a keen amateur interest that's informing a lot of um, what I write rather than specifically uh, elements I'm drawing on, drawing on my um, formal education for. Would you say it's about being really to, willing to follow your curiosity where it goes and pick up on the things that spark your interest? Um, it's almost it's it's almost it's kind of more proactive than that. It's it's more that I so I, as like I say, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I keep tabs on a certain amount of kind of scientific development and areas I'm interested in. And things will just go into the bag, as it were. And then at some point I will say, oh, that will be, uh, you yeah, know, it will be interesting to write a book based on that. Or I'll have a book, another book that's coming together. I think I can use that element of study that I came across and I'll read up on it a bit more and incorporate it into the book. So mm -hmm. it's um, really, I, I'm kind of, um, I guess I'm accumulating seeds by just sort of um, casually, uh, picking up information as I go along. Well, re related to that, um, I've got a message from S. Pankovich, who notes that your plot flows very naturally to amazing endings. Thank you. And they're wondering if you have the story all plotted out when you start, or do you find that the thought experiments as you're running them lead you to surprising conclusions that inform the narrative? So my normal process is to plan quite heavily. Um, and I'll usually have a chapter plan and a sort of a point by point plan within each chapter. 
except to the very end of the book. I'll generally leave that up to the characters, really. I will, tr I trust that by the time I get to the last few chapters, the book will have a momentum and a, traje a trajectory which will tell me how the book needs to end. And I mean, if people have read Children of Time, one of the things people generally really like the ending of Children of Time. It's a, I mean, I think I, I don't need to worry, hopefully, about spoiling a book that's that's sort of seven, eight years old now. But um, it's got a very up, it's got a, an up, a, an upbeat ending that arises very much out of events in the book, but at the same time is not necessarily where the book is obviously going to go. Um, that ending was not planned. That ending basically came to me as I got to the last few chapters and. Knowing that, you can see the book could have very obviously gone to profoundly different and rather darker mm -hmm. ways. Um, I have recently been experimenting with different uh, writing modes. I know a lot of writers who just sit and write and without any great plan to start off with, which I find, I find hard to conceive of. But what I have done is I've created the world. So this is with um, City of Last Chances, which is my recent fantasy book. I've created the world. And the characters and then i've just kind of let the characters get on with it which tends to result in this interweaving mosaic of lives which is what i was after with after for that particular book um so i am i'm experimenting a bit with how i go about things but in general i'm quite a solid planner well for someone who plans so much before you write you're also incredibly incredibly prolific um well those so two things those two things are connected um how, how are they connected because having a plan means you don't meander around you don't have to go back and retcon a lot of stuff you don't have to rewrite a lot of stuff uh in general where i where i plan the book out um my first draft and my submission draft are extremely are very very similar uh, i i will have an editing pass but i won't have any kind of major structural reworking unless something has gone badly wrong as it sometimes does uh but i do one of the things i can attribute my output to is the fact that i do plan well sal here is also asking do you write every day um, or how do you approach the writing part of the creation of a story uh so yes i i write every day or at least i try to i generally i write in the morning and i kind of then run out of inspiration after a certain point in time at that point i need to go off and do something else um which may be editing or admin or work on a games project or something like that um and then event then by the next morning the tank will have refilled and i'll be ready to go again um my one of the other reasons i write as much as i do is i can go about two weeks without actually writing something new before i start going a bit stir crazy so uh, i i am i do have a, a kind of a psychological compulsion to get stuff done um specifically to you know to actually create completely new you know written mat written material um so yes um and you know it's i as a compulsion go i think it's probably not psychologically healthy uh it is however commercially con commercially convenient and um yeah uh i i i write i write I certainly write every weekday and when things are going particularly um sort of particularly well I'll be writing weekends as well have you ever found anything else that sort of scratches that itch I know I've I've heard other sci-fi fantasy authors say things like running a tabletop campaign or even like doing hard math will will kind of exercise that same creative part of their brain do you have anything like that uh not quite I mean I think does write writing tabletop campaigns is kind of at least adjacent in the same space but uh, one of the interesting things i found is so i i for the last few years i've also been doing sort of piece work for role play piece work for role playing game manuals and that does not take up the same space in my head so i can do that and also be writing a book at the same time without any kind of uh, drain on my resources and i think it's because it doesn't have a narrative i think you know because I, I, it's 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 work like you know create 10 monsters or something like that and I can exercise the imag my imagination but because I'm not actually stringing together something um, complex it's not tapping the same kind of well of inspiration mm -hmm. well 
I, I find that I can I can kind of see the influence of of games and gaming in your writing. I know in, in all your author bios it says that you are uh, not only a LARPer but um, you kind of got your start. Your your first work that was published was kind of came from a tabletop game. Can you can you talk a little bit more about just the influence of games and gaming on your writing? Yeah, I mean, if if not for role playing, I wouldn't be a writer. Um, I can say with absolute certainty. Um, I used to, so I used to be uh, tabled at role playing with my with my big thing, and especially I was generally the games master, which meant that I got very practiced in creating very robust, complete worlds that would survive all of the various things that players would try and do to break them, and I got very um, accomplished at creating distinct characters um, in on 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 mass at. Um, at a, at a moment's notice and these are all extremely good transferable skills to writing i also um then encountered at about the age of 16 17 the books the dragon lance chronicles yeah. uh by vice and hickman and they were someone's write-up of a role-playing campaign and that just switched the light bulb on saying this is potentially a thing you can do because you you know you are also a role player you could also write you could therefore also write a book and without that i don't think i'd ever have even considered that it might be a possibility um and yes i mean in addition to that the shadows of the app series my first books with enormous 10 book fantasy series if anyone wants a really long sort of complicated epic fantasy read with a cast of thousands um they that is all based on the world of a role-playing game campaign i ran when i was in university in the early 90s and is that a world that you came up with yourself or was it based on a, an existing system Oh, no, no, it's entirely, well, I mean, there would be serious intellectual property issues if with the last. <laughs> I, fair enough, fair uh, no, enough. It's entirely, it's entirely based on my own, but also I have generally, with a couple of exceptions where the game is very, very world specific, like uh, the Star Wars role playing game or something like that, mm. I have generally always made up my own worlds for games. I've not, I, you know, I've, I've never really run a campaign in the Forgotten Realms or um, the Greyhawk or the Dragonlance. Mm -hmm. Um, world with a uh, Toril, I think it may be called. I might be I, wrong on that one. I don't know. Something vaguely like <laughs> that. Um, speaking, speaking of your inspirations, um, another question from Steve here, who is saying, or asking, to the extent that you're able to say, how much do you base your characters on people that you know? Um, so normally not, but occasionally entirely. <laughs> So, for example, my regular gaming group, um, which are who I am still gaming with, all turn up in Guns of the Dawn as as background characters, um, as does my wife, who I kill off in the book, and she was not very amused with that. <laughs> um, and also, so the point in the Shadows of the Apt books where there's kind of a new cast of characters come in because I killed quite a few, and because I I wanted the, you know a group of younger characters in and. A lot of the characters from about uh, book eight, the air war onwards, they are based on people I used to LARP with. They are based on people um, I used to play World of Warcraft with, um, you know, all, all with p p permission and, you know, or at least based on their characters uh, more, than, more than they themselves, I guess. And I recently was listening to the audio books of Shadows of the App. This had an audio book release in the last couple of years um, with at a the narrator ben allen does an incredible job because there are a lot of characters in that series but it was this very weird nostalgia trip of just running into all of these people many of who i've you know i've not been in touch with for about a decade and just running into them all kind of encrypted within the book well i can i can think of one or two characters in your books that i would hope are not based on real people but for <laughs> for uh safety reasons we won't say who and why um I, I wanted to circle back around to um, the idea of, of alien species and, and uh, animals that are more charismatic that can connect with you and that and that sort of thing. Because um, when I've been explaining your books to our, our patrons and our librarians, I'll, I'll often start with Children of Time. I'll say, "Yeah, it's great. It's all about spiders." And the first <laughs> reaction is kind of like a like a little bit of a seize up here. Um, one of our librarians in particular, he he cannot handle spiders. Anything spider related, he's out the door. So I'm I'm wondering how how have you managed to build build empathy with a creature that a lot of humans have a sort of visceral reaction to 
I mean, this is one one reason why I think the book does land so well is because it is spiders, and spiders are certainly in the West the most t detested um, creature creature you, that, that that there is. Nobody, nothing is as hated by as many people as spiders are. I mean, I I have as 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 is hopefully very obvious, very fond of spiders, but an awful lot of people have that reaction. Um, and so writing a book about empathy with the other that is also about spiders is that big challenge that I wanted to set myself. And it seems to have worked. And I, I mean, the thing is, I was kind of, it's worth noting when I wrote that book, I wrote it on spec. It wasn't um, sort of specifically contracted. I was a fancy writer. I was writing a hard sci-fi book. It was not necessarily ever going to get published and my the publisher when they did publish it did it as a bit of a sideline just probably to keep me happy because they wanted me to keep writing the fantasy um i wrote that book for me i didn't necessarily think about writing it for people who didn't like spiders um i think the reason it works is because i do like spiders so much and i think my my love of them comes through in the writing it's probably i honestly i think it's as simple as that i i am so i am rooting for the spiders in the book so hard and i'm so invested in their struggles and their tragedies and their the obstacles they have to overcome as a as a species and a civilization that i think my own sheer joy in the subject matter comes through in the prose well i'm just one person but I, I think you did succeed as as well there. Um, one, one of the interesting things, though, one of the reasons why perhaps it does work so well is you spend a lot of time getting into the spider's heads, as it were, and exploring how a creature would communicate that has completely different sensory organs from a human, a completely different ability to vo vocalize than a human. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process of, or your interest in communication in linguistics, if you have one? I mean, yeah, I, I obviously do have one because it turns up a lot in my books. I hadn't, I wouldn't have necessarily thought that I did when I was writing Children of Time, but looking back now with that and Children of Ruin and Elder Race and even the stuff I'm currently writing, which is also all about communication and miscommunication between humans and aliens um it is obviously something that really fascinates me and i think it's because intelligence fascinates me uh and intel the way the other ways that intelligence might operate and i think sense um the sensorium is an enormous part of that how uh because everything we know about the world comes in through our senses there is a vast amount of information about the world that we as humans don't have access to that various other animals do and that in some cases almost no animals do i mean there, there's a particular type of light that only i think mantis shrimps of any creature we know can, mm -hmm. can even see um and so we what we think of as this enormous world that we have this a faithful reproduction of entering through eyes and ears and our various other senses we're actually getting out of an enormously curated and edited experience and any other creature as it evolves is getting a very different experience to us and therefore when it is um when it gets to the point where it is sort of recognizably sapient it's going to be very different to us and it's going to communicate in very different ways because it simply has those different senses um you know if if, if you can't hear like we can hear then you won't be speaking like we speak um and this is again it's all part of this fascinating kind of thought experiment you can play with um speculative evolution whether it's earth animals you're looking at um and just rerunning evolution um to see if you can get a different result or whether it's you're looking at a completely alien planet where the your starting parameters are completely different mm -hmm. and that's honestly it's one of the the most fun parts of both writing and reading uh, science fiction I, I always really appreciate when i find a book which has some really interesting concepts of aliens or some really interesting ideas of evolution um that that's some of my my favorite type of uh type of sci-fi to read do you have any examples for someone who might be interested in reading more books with similar themes to yours Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So um, Sue Burke um, has written a book called Semiosis, which is very much in that kind of children of time sort of 
area. Um, I've just read Anne Leckie's Translation State, which is a superb, it's got some just some very alien aliens, even though they're kind of half human. And she writes from their point of view, and it is some of the best, um, and it's obviously some of the most emotive writing uh, I've come across. Also, the, the audiobook for that is excellent. I've, I, I, I get through a lot of audiobooks more than print books these days, and the narrator is, is, is superb. Um, Dark Eden by Chris Beckett is has a really fascinating. It's got some, a fascinating human story as well, but also the planet it's on is very interesting with some really weird stuff. And it's a dark planet. It's a planet where most of what is going on is going on under the surface, and the humans who live on the surface uh, have been stranded there. They only really see the very fringes of the entire sort of world's ecosystem and you just get these maddening tantalizing glimpses of what's going on sort of within the world well thank you um and and for anyone listening in we'll have we'll have a recording of this uh online so if you didn't catch all those you can come back and, and find some books to put on hold at the library um I just did want to mention that uh, Luna here has left us a comment that is not a question, but they just wanted to say that a spider crawled across their desk and is hanging out with them <laughs> as they watch this, so they think that the spiders are rooting for you too, uh, <laughs> with a with a smiley face. Um, as as we were talking a bit about about spiders and alienness, it, it seems that what we're speaking about is. The idea of both empathy and the other, which is a thing that you said mm -hmm. that you're in the past, you said that your books really do focus on. And I think it's what a lot of a lot of sci-fi that deals with extraterrestrial life or evolution is about. Um, but in a lot of sci-fi, those those contacts don't usually go well, um, at least not at first. And I'm wondering how you find that balance between perhaps pessimism and optimism in speculative fiction. You did mention that um, In Children of Time has a, a pretty hopeful ending, but you didn't know that it would end like that. And you do have a particular series, um, which is literally called Terrible Worlds. And it's <laughs> about terrible worlds um, that can be quite bleak at times. So how, how, do you, how do you balance the sort of narrative need for, for conflict and and just the reality of of bleakness in our world with the sort of open-minded optimism that speculative fiction can breed. I mean, I think I know there is um I mean, there is certainly a, like a fantasy tradition of sort of bleak, gritty narratives in the kind of the grim dark vein. Um, that's sort of yeah, you know, it it I think it's no longer quite as dominant as it was, but there was a time when basically all of the fantasy you got was basically that kind of thing. Um and there is certainly um, a dystopian sci-fi vein about basically which is kind of like the future is awful and we're all going to die. Um, the variation being, well, this is how we're going to die in this book. Um, and without more, these are not terribly satisfying narratives. Um, y y if you lean very hard into the grimdark sort of fantasy, it's just kind of grim and everyone is kind of unpleasant and it's you don't really like any of the characters you don't like any of the situations bad thing there's it's just kind of a litany of bad thing happening to everyone kind of indiscriminately and it, you, that you get jaded to that very quickly in the same way that if it's basically oh yes this is the future and here are the people who are going to be doing the bad things in the future and here is all the people the bad things are being done for and nothing is ever going to change then that is all that is partly that is just a bit grim and not terribly enjoyable to read but also i think it's important when you're talking about especially um near future um dystopias it's very important not to suggest that there is nothing that can be done because if people get to the point of thinking that there is nothing you can do and i, I i've always felt that there is a certain set of people who don't want people to do anything because they're making a lot of money out of it, um, who want you to think that there is nothing that you can do. Um, if you believe that, then you're not going to do anything and nothing will get done. And then we will get to the point where there's nothing you can do and that won't work out well for anyone, even the people who are making lots of money. Um, so writing these stories in a way to suggest, actually, yes, you can turn the tables. Um, you know, you can 
save you 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 can save mankind you can save the world um is both makes it a better story and is just more socially responsible i think and it's a theme that comes up quite a bit because i i was being a bit a bit um obfuscatory when I was talking about Terrible Worlds because half of the series is called Terrible Worlds Revolutions and it is about <laughs> making change in a terrible world and the idea or the concept of, of revolution of uprising is a a pretty dominant theme in a lot of your work um even city of last chances which which just came out well, especially city of last especially chances. city of last chances <laughs> <laughs> um and the interesting thing about about the city of last chances in particular is that um a lot of the characters in in the text itself it says that this person is a is a bad person and yet they're still likable they're under they're understandable oh. um how how do you how do you manage to to create a character who is who is both by the prose's own admission a bad person but is still a person who is you you can understand their motivations and you do in a way want to root for them a lot of the time it comes down to who they are a bad person to which i you know as i have control a certain amount of control of the narrative i can make sure that they are they are, they are not the bad person who is constantly just kicking puppies all the way down the street they are the bad person who is scheming to outwit the equally or equally bad or worse person who is kind of you know the local so the local sort of um, political officer or the crooked academic or whoever else I've got going on. And so you kind of, there's a hierarchy of bad. Um, the other way, of course, is, is, is humor. I mean, one of the ways I think that grimdark, hum grimdark fiction works extremely well is you look at, say, um, Joe Abercrombie, who is one of the great masters of it, is it's very funny. And the characters are very funny. You see inside the character's head and the characters tend to have this kind of slightly detached wry perspective on the world they know they're bad and they know the world is rotten and they that self-awareness and the you know the moment that they recognize that the the thing that they you know the 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 scrape they've just got out of was a their own fault and b they got out of it by basically falling out of a window because their shoe laces were tied together or something like that it's just i think that kind of um the moments of bathos or bathos however you pronounce that are what redeems a lot of those characters and the fact that when when you get to that moment they don't kind of throw a tantrum they kind of just acknowledge yes i did absolutely bring that on myself and fine i'm going to have to live with the consequences which, uh, in my opinion, is a thing that you you do as well. When I was talking to to a, a fellow librarian about um, walking to Aldebaran, which, in in my opinion, is one of your your bleaker books. Their first comment about it was, "Oh, that book was hilarious. It was so funny." <laughs> um, so I, I think this is a this is a thing that that you do as well. So if anyone well, out there this is, is one ahead, of the please. things one of the things I I absolutely do is because I'm aware of this. The bleaker the book the more jokes there are in the prose so yes walking to Alderaan is spectacularly bleak especially as you get to the end and work out what is actually going on but at the same time the the narrator Gary Randall is hopefully quite amusing as as he goes on and he has a lot of kind of little jokes and and comments and sort of wry observations and kind of carries it through and then uh, I mean the other one which is also in the Terrible World series um one day all this will be yours is I, by my own estimation, the funniest thing I have ever written. It is basically, I mean, I'm not ever going to get to like Pratchett levels of funny, but it's it's certainly going in that general direction. And again, it's a first person narrative. And again, you work out at a certain point of the book, the main character, quite early on in this one, the main character is absolutely dreadful as a person, as a, as, as a human being. And the backdrop is that he is living at the end of time because the entirety of human history has been destroyed in a war and now exists in these separate broken bits of causality and so that's that's really very dark but at the same time he's very funny <laughs> and that's how i that i do i do tend to kind of ratchet up the humor in response to the fact that actually what i'm talking about is really quite unrelievably grim well from from the comments i've heard 
it has been working. So keep <laughs> keep that one up. Um, I've, I've got a question here uh, from Hope, who says that they know that some authors will not read other books at all while writing to avoid the influence of those books seeping into their writing or accidental plagiarism. Uh, do you avoid reading while actively working on a book? Uh, no, I mean, I, I actually find if I stop reading, I tend, I tend to, um, my writing tends to suffer. Uh, reading is one of the things that sort of turn, turns the mills of inspiration. So I will usually have a print book on the go and an audio book on the go at any given time. Although my 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 print reading speed has really nosedived in the last few years, sadly. Do you tend to read in the same genre, or do you kind of go across the across the spectrum, regardless of what you're working on? Almost entire. I mean, I don't sort of specifically single out um, the the specific kind of corner of the genre I'm working in, but I'm always, I, I almost always read within genre in general. I, I tend to find I need a, a speculative element to whatever I'm reading to hold my interest. Um, in general, it, it frequently what I will find I need is I need a certain uh, sophistication of style. Um, there are some readers who I, I kind of quite enjoy, but I also can only really read them in those brief moments in between books because, I mean, so a lot of a lot of a 30s pulp style fiction the style is extremely spare and i find if i'm reading stuff that's written in that written like that it tends to have a bit of a negative impact on my own style so i need to read something where the the writing is quite um uh sort of elegant and accomplished and detailed in a way that um sort of 30s commercial prose isn't uh, speaking of speaking of your your reading habits, um, S. Penkovich here is asking if you enjoy reading any Afrofuturism. I've read some. Yes, I haven't read it as much as I should do. Um, I don't know if you know uh, Tade Thompson. Um, is is it the Light of Dying Stars? I think that's the most recent one I read, and I just want to make sure I've got that um, title right. Uh, no, Far from the Light of Heaven. I beg your pardon. Uh, so that's the mo that's the most recent um, Afro, Afro futurist book I've read, but it, it's a genre I do I do need to read more in. I think. Um, and, uh, Nadia Corafor is another uh, favorite of mine in that. Um, speaking of speaking of inspirations and um, the opposite of of plagiarism is that you've written short stories and even a novel in worlds that you did not create. Um, you've got Sherlock Holmes and Shakespeare and Warhammer. Uh, <laughs> how how is the process of writing in someone else's world different from creating your own? Um, so I mean the, the the Holmes and the Shakespeare you still got a fair amount of freedom. I mean I mean my my Sherlock Holmes story is 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 i i mean it's i feel it's a good story but i don't think it's necessarily a good sherlock holmes story because it's a story about a wizard who summons sherlock holmes as a a kind of a conjured demon to help him solve a murder and i think that would probably explode arthur conan doyle's head um and with the shakespeare again it's i mean shakespeare didn't have a world particularly he was writing in this weird kind of space where he'd inherited a bunch of concept from the Decameron and other 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 books and was just kind of throwing them together in a way of retelling stories he already knew but then you get onto Warhammer and Warhammer is very different because there you have someone who is actively and very very um vigorously curating the um the universe because everything has got to fit it fit together because Warhammer fans have an enormous eye for detail and that was that was a an education because I have never been edited so vigorously as I have on the the Warhammer books because everything has got to be right and because a lot of the things you kind of think of with a science fiction universe even yeah, even the particular that particular type of science fiction universe don't actually work that way because it has a peculiar kind of retro approach to a lot of um, basic areas of technology and that kind of thing. You yeah, um. Speaking, speaking of world building, um, it might be, uh, I, I think it might be accurate to say, at least at least in, in America, you're, you're most well known for your science fiction, but as noted, you do write fantasy as well. But none of it lands in that sort of lightly medieval, but with magic setting that a lot of Western fantasy has defaulted to. Uh, you've got the steampunk world with the bug people. Um, you have a, a war novel that has Regency vibes. Um, 
Can you can you talk more about your fantasy research specifically and world building for those those stories? So uh, certainly with the early stuff, I mean, again, it's it's more a matter of what has previously gone in that then ends up being um, drawn upon. So, for example, a lot of the the basic sort of political setup with the Shadows of the Apt is based on um, the classical world. So you have a sort of there's a certain sort of um, Greek and Macedonian and Persian feel to what's going on right at the start, and then of course you throw in the steampunk technology and accelerate things up to um, to World War Two really quite quickly throughout the books. Um, so it's very much a matter of me picking up ideas, saying, "Oh, that's a bit different. I haven't seen that done much before," um, which is probably the reason I haven't done sort of standard medieval in particular because that is very very heavily subscribed in fantasy and also the middle ages that you get in a fantasy novel um is frequently not very historical and often really quite problematic from a historical point of view because of the things it omits or because of the things it includes so for, i mean frequently you will get something that is very obviously say the catholic church because before oh, the middle ages you have the catholic church but the catholic church exists in the middle ages for reasons you know there are there is a whole set of events that lead to there being a catholic church at all and for it having a particular um relationship with um sort of the kings and princes of the time and all of that sort of thing there is a reason why feudal knighthood develops there are all of these things which tend to get kind of slotted in as complete um and distinct concepts that don't relate to anything else in the setting aren't actually like that and that once you start looking at history you start to realize that none of it really makes sense and a lot of the fantasy fantasy worlds just have this weird grab they're a bit like one of the old mgm um king arthur films or something like that it's this weird grab bag of concepts from about 800 years of history all shoved together in a way that looks on the surface like it makes sense but the more you think about it the less it does and nobody ever has guilds I mean, actually, there's an enormous amount of genuine medieval stuff that never makes it into fantasy novels, um, which is just just really, you know, because you, you, the amount, what people get up to um, in areas that do not directly deal with kings and knights is so much more interesting than who won the Battle of the Thing in 1483 or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um and yet that's never where medieval fantasy goes i mean if people want to read a really interesting and well thought through fantasy setting actually um juliet mckenna has written about four or five separate cycles of books starting with the einarin series and that's a really interesting uh setting because if nothing else it's like it's one of the few medievalish fantasy settings where there is a full-on peasants revolt about midway through <laughs> or pratchett actually you know pratchett's pratchett um also uh, pratchett had a has a very sophisticated grasp of genuine history that he draws upon in his um discworld books i i know we have we have many many pratchett fans in the library um and most of them are available on ebook too uh we're we're getting kind of towards the end of the end of our time here. I I guess I, I'd like us to to wrap up with um, I I just like to ask you, do you have a, a particular a particular book of yours that is just really really special to you? Um, that maybe, you know, every, everyone uh who's familiar with your work probably knows about Children of Time, and they might be familiar with some of the more the the bigger titles. But is there one that's just kind of under the radar that you'd like you'd like to promote a little bit? Um, there was, so I'll, I'll give you a sci-fi and a fantasy. Um, sci-fi wise, Dogs of War is not one of my better known books, but it is, I think, one of my absolute best, where because of the, just because of the way I structure the book, I think the, the character and the concept balance really, really well. Um, in fantasy, uh, we've mentioned a couple of times, but City of Last Chances, which is, came out at the end of last year. Um, I had enormous fun writing that book it's done pretty well so far um there'll be a second one out maybe as soon as the end of this year in that setting um and yes it would it would enormously gladden my heart if people saw that one out and read it and city of last chances has a phenomenal cover um so yes. as much as as much as i love to advocate for for getting your books from the library if you want to pick that one up it'll look really nice in your bookshelf <laughs> uh and 
Dogs of War, uh, if you are a Heart District Library patron, the audiobook of Dogs of War is available on our Hoopla platform. And the audiobook of Dogs of War is amazing. It's a multi-narrator cast. Um, we also have the sequel, Bearhead. So if you're interested in, in near future military sci-fi that asks a lot of interesting political questions, put that one on the top of your list for sure. Um, well, th thank you so, so, so much for um, coming here and, and talking to us today. Um, uh, please, everyone watching, uh, if you're on Twitter, please follow Adrian on Twitter. Um, it's at apt shadow, A-P-T shadow, mm -hmm. um, for uh, great little jokes and also really, really intricately painted lizard figurines. Uh, you can look forward to that. Um, and if, if you want to hear more from him or more about his works, he and um, another renowned and excellent sci-fi author, um, Anne Leckie of, of Translation State, um, will be talking about alien minds in a virtual discussion on June 21st that's being hosted by Orbit Books. Uh, so go to their website if you're interested in hearing more about that. Um, on, on the library front, we've got some more fantasy sci-fi things happening coming up. As I mentioned, our sci-fi book club is meeting monthly, and next month's book is going to be The Kaiju Preservation Society by John Scalzi. Uh, so oh, if you're interested good. in giant monsters um, and, and lighthearted, fun sci-fi, please please give that a read, and we meet at the Bruce Dillery, so it's it's a really good time. Um, is is there is there any anything else you'd like to say, anything else you'd like to plug, Adrian, before we, we let you get back to writing? No, I think we've covered everything. I mean, do do enjoy um, Kaiju Preservation Society. I really love that. Um, I'm sure we will. Um, thank you. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.